Father, I am so thankful for what you are doing and have done at Calvary Chapel, South Bay. And I pray now that as we go into your word, that we would hear the sincerity, I believe, of the Spirit speaking through your word for the church today. Would you give us the grace, Lord, to be, have spiritual ears to hear so that we can operate in the power of the resurrection in these days? It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said. Amen. What an incredible day last Sunday. Yes. To have the peace of his presence among us. To hear his word and receive the direction of the resurrection, rejoice. To sense his power moving in our midst as lives were being changed. Now, you think I'm talking about just our time last week. But I'm talking about the conversation the disciples would be having during the week after the resurrection. Think about it for just a moment. As they discussed amongst themselves, he showed up, like in the room. He showed us his hands. He showed us his side. Like, it was unbelievable. All of our lives are changed. It is just like what happened for us last week. I don't know if you know... But at the 6 a.m. service, people were sitting on the grass across the street from Knox and were coming forward, crossing Knox to give their life to Jesus Christ. It sounds like the same resurrection experience that the disciples had is the same thing that we experienced here at Calvary Chapel South Bay. Take a look at John chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening... Being the first day of the week, as a measure of review, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. He spoke peace. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples were glad, were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to him again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. He gives direction. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Wow, their experience sounds so similar to our experience. We heard the word, we felt the power of his presence, we saw lives being changed. I mean, it's the same resurrection experience from 2,000 years ago, yet someone was missing. Take a look with me, if you would, at John chapter 20, verse 24. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we've seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, take a look, I will will not believe. I will not believe. How many of us have family and friends that will not believe? You know someone at work, and they will not believe. Is that anyone's experience in our world today? Does anyone have anyone like Thomas in their life? I Go ahead, raise your hand. Let me see. I will not believe. You see... <coughs> Thomas was not with them. And just like many of us who've got friends or family that missed the incredible experience that we had at Easter last week, Thomas missed it as well. And no matter how you try to communicate what happened last week, oh, I talked to an unbeliever today, I mean, this past week, and I was telling them what they missed at Calvary Chapel South Bay. And they just kind of blew me off. Well, they were unbeliever. They just didn't understand. And maybe that was your experience because you prayed for. You asked your family to come. You even bribed your child. I'll give you a hundred bucks if you just come to Easter. But they didn't show up. And now it's the Sunday after. And you're thinking to yourselves, well, I guess Easter is over. So I'll try again next year. Well, that may not be the best way to think about God's plan for their life. And it may not be the best way to think about what is God's 
way. But before I go on with the story, Thomas had really missed out on an incredible event. He had really missed out. Thomas missed out of being in the presence of the Lord. Thomas had missed out on hearing his word and receiving his peace, being filled with the Spirit. I mean, simply because he was not there. So what I want to do for just a minute before I go on with the message is take a little commercial break. And this commercial break is about the importance of gathering together every week. Look what Thomas missed out on simply because he didn't go to church on Sunday. Now, let me help you understand. It's Hebrews chapter 10. Now, this message and commercial break is not for any of you. You're sitting here. You're right here in church. It's for everyone that's online. It's Hebrews chapter 10. Would you take a look at verse 23? Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. In other words, stay strong in the faith. There's the encouragement. But now look at the direction. Here's how to stay strong, he says. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So he gives the encouragement, hold on to the faith. And then he gives the direction, the way that you can hold on to the faith is if you find yourself gathering together on Sunday. Now why on Sunday? Well, it's because what, it's the first church celebrated. Take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. The Bible says, on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, let each one of you lay something aside. So he's saying, when you gather on the first day of the week, well, why on Sunday? Well, it's obvious. Jesus rose from the grave on Sunday. Sunday, the first day of the week, became known as the Lord's Day, where they would gather to feel the presence of to receive the peace and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was just an expectation. Jesus was going to show up. And Jesus showed up there on that resurrection Sunday morning. Now think of what Thomas missed out on. That very first resurrection church service Sunday morning. Imagine what the following week looked like for Thomas as compared for the rest of the disciples. The disciples had joy, but Thomas was miserable. The disciples had peace. They'd been to church. They'd been with Jesus, but he had anxiety. The disciples, they now had the faith that God was in control. They had the hope of eternal life. They had a love and an embrace and an acceptance from Jesus Christ himself. And Thomas, Thomas didn't have any of this because he neglected gathering together with believers. All because he missed out on church. That's why the scripture says, don't neglect gathering together. You see, church is where the spirit of the Lord is. And I'm going to show you that in just a moment. And here we get to sense his peace and his presence and his power. Do you know that Jesus loves going to church? Do you know that Jesus is right here in our midst and we believe that by faith? Do you know that God loves when we gather together? Now, Thomas made a decision. He's facing a very huge trial in his life. He's got a lot of pain in his heart and he woke up on Sunday morning and he, he knew the disciples were getting together and he made a decision, I'm not going to church today. It hurts too bad. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. He chose to isolate in the midst of his pain, and it didn't work. Can I tell you, church? It never works. It's the enemy's lie to keep you from coming and being a part. Now, you might be saying, Pastor Chet, why are you telling us we're here in church? No, there is going to be a moment in your life when you won't want to be here. So I am giving you an encouragement that isolation doesn't work. When we come together as believers, we sense the peace of God and his presence and his power because we are the body of Christ. And Jesus promises something. Wherever two or more are gathered, there I am in the midst. Now that's important. That, amen. That's important. 
That's important. Let me tell you why that's so important. I believe I have the gift of exhortation. I have no problem telling you what the Word of God says no matter how you feel about it. I have that gift. It's the gift of exhortation. Now, can you imagine if all of us had the gift of exhortation? Thank God my wife has the gift of mercy so that when I give my exhortation, you can go to her for a hug. <laughs> Don't come to me for a hug. If you come to me crying, I'll be like, what's your problem? If you go to my wife with the gift of mercy, she'll be like, oh, come here. What's wrong? Don't listen to him. <laughs> no, listen to him when he's exhorting you, but come here and let me give you a little bit of mercy. You see, where two or more are gathered, we represent the full body of Christ because he's given each of us a gift so that we can apply that gift, exercise that gift when we get together so that when we are together, we sense his peace, we sense his presence, we sense his power. Don't neglect gathering together. Stay in fellowship. Now, back into our story, I really believe Thomas has been given a bad rap and he's been given a bad name. Think about this. For 2,000 years, okay, 2,000 years, a man who was speared to death for his faith in India, for 2,000 years, the church has called him Doubting Thomas. Think about that for a moment. I am terrified of this personally. Listen, I've been to Iran twice. I have been around the world for the gospel. I've lived in Africa as a missionary. I've raised my children there. I have suffered for the sake. I've run for my life for the gospel. I've been jailed for the gospel. I've been all around the world for the gospel. And I tell my wife all the time, you know how I'm going to die? I'm going to be walking in the backyard. I will leave a rake out. I will step on the rake. It'll hit me in the head and I will die. And for the rest of the church's life, they will say, you remember Chet? Oh, you mean the one that died by the rake. Can you imagine if you made one mistake and for the rest of church history, I call you by that mistake? Like, oh, lying Sally, for the rest of your life. Oh, did you gossip Dave? Oh, gossip Dave. We're going to call you gossip Dave. For the, think of poor Thomas. He makes one mistake and the church knows him as doubting Thomas for 2,000 years. The problem is, doubt wasn't even his issue. Thomas was not a doubter. Thomas was not a believer. Thomas said, I will not believe. So if you want to give Thomas a name, don't call him Doubting Thomas. There was no doubt about him. He was confident. He's unbelieving Thomas. He has lost Thomas. He is faithless Thomas. You can even go so far as prodigal Thomas, but don't call him doubting. He wasn't wavering as to whether or not this was true. He makes a very strong statement. I will not believe. Now, even though the church has made a mistake with Thomas, I believe the Spirit is giving us this story of Thomas for our day in the 21st century. Church, we are living in the days of Thomas. We are living in the days of Thomas. We are living in the days of unbelief. And I want to prove it to you by asking two questions in regards to Thomas so that you can understand what we are facing in our day. The first question that I have is, why wasn't Thomas there? Why did he choose not to be with the other believers and no longer believe? Why wasn't Thomas there? And I think the answer can be found right in verse 24. Would you take a look? John chapter 20, verse 24. The Bible says this, Now Thomas called the twin. Now there's something you need to know about the Hebrew and the Greek. Thomas is the Greek, excuse me, Thomas is the Hebrew word for twin. Then he said, the Bible says, called the twin. So first he says the Hebrew word, Thomas, which means the twin. And then Mark is writing to Romans. He's writing to Gentiles. So he then explains this Hebrew word in Greek, in Didymus, and he says, oh, that's the twin. He gives him the Greek and he gives him the Hebrew of the same word. Now, even if Thomas is a twin, no Jewish parent would have named their child the twin. It just wouldn't have been. Just imagine, one of the twins is born. Oh, this one, Yeshua. 
This one, Emmanuel. This one, oh, let's call this one uh, 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 Joshua. Oh, this one, the twin. It just wouldn't happen. Jewish parents named their children with godly names. It's just what they did. No Jewish parent would have named their child the twin. In fact, we know from church history that this wasn't his name. Thomas's name was Judas, according to church history. But he was called the twin. Do you remember when Jesus first met Peter? He looked at him and said, you are Simon, you will be called Cephas. Levi. You're Levi, but you're going to be called Matthew. This was a name that was given to Thomas. He was called the twin. And I believe he was called the twin because he was most like Jesus of all the disciples. I'm going to prove it to you. It's John chapter 11. Take a look at the screen. Jesus is saying, I'm going to go and I'm going to set Lazarus free. I'm going to wake him up. And Jesus says, I'm going to go. I'm heading that direction. I'm going to Bethany and and let's go there. And all the disciples are like, "Uh, wait a second, Jesus. Didn't they say they were going to stone you there? How about we not go? Thomas, who is called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. I want to be with Jesus because I'm most like Jesus. And if Jesus wants to go die, I want to go die with him because I am the twin. Wherever Jesus is, there I am. I am his shadow, so much so that when Jesus said, listen, I'm going away, in John chapter 14, Thomas, and only Thomas, asked the question, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? I'm the twin. Wherever you go, I got to be. I am your replica. I want to be your ambassador. I want to represent you. You see, Thomas was given this name, the twin. And I want to tell you why and maybe answer the question why Thomas wasn't there. Thomas wasn't there because he was disappointed in God and he was disappointed in God's people. He was disappointed. He didn't show up. He didn't come for that resurrection Sunday morning. He's disappointed in God. This is the guy who was the twin. He was willing to die for Jesus. And now the Lord didn't do what Thomas thought that the Lord should do. God didn't show up the way that Thomas felt that he should have shown up. You should have been the king. You were the Lord of lords. I was willing to do anything for you and with you. But then the disciples say that he's arisen. He's alive. And then this husband and wife are walking on the road to Emmaus and Jesus shows up to them. They come back and there's Thomas and they say, oh listen, Jesus is alive. We saw him. Think of Thomas for just a moment. Why would Jesus show up for you but he didn't show up for me? I mean, you weren't here with the disciples. You were on the road to Emmaus. So why did Jesus do for you that he wouldn't do for me? I mean, really? God, why won't you do what I want you to do? And can I tell you in the days of Thomas, there are a lot of people that have walked away from the faith because they're disappointed with God. I have been to many hospital bedrooms when someone has taken their last breath. And oftentimes, the very first question that someone will turn and say to me is, why didn't God heal them? Why didn't God show up the way that I wanted God to show up? Why didn't he do for me what I've seen him do for other people? I've seen him heal other people. Why hasn't he done it for me? Disappointment with God over personal expectations has caused many people to walk away. We're living in the days of Thomas. But he was also disappointed with God's people. His name is Judas. Judas, who was a follower of God. In fact, we have a post-betrayal view of Judas. The Bible says that Judas was Jesus' best friend. In Psalms, the Bible says they would walk hand in hand into the temple. 
You look at him as the betrayer, but Thomas saw him as the best friend of Jesus, a believer. I mean, are you serious? I can't believe what Judas did. Judas had betrayed the Lord. And now Thomas is being told by the disciples that Jesus is alive. Listen, I'm no fool. I'm not going to believe, uh, be fooled for a second time. I believe Judas, and I believe that he was a great guy. And once a mistake, twice a fool. I'm not going to believe you now. Can I tell you, this is how many people feel about religion in the days of Thomas today. And you know, this is the way many people feel about religious people today. You see, what happens is that they look at history and they see how religion has played a part in so much of the world's turmoil. People that called themselves followers of God. Think of the Crusades and the amount of Muslims that were killed in the name of Jesus. You could go to the Holocaust Museum. You could go to the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem and see a Roman Catholic cardinal heiling Hitler. Do you wonder why it's so difficult for Jews to come to Christ? They're looking at God's people who are people that call themselves God's people and go, wait a second, if that's God, I want nothing to do with him. See, those that have called themselves God's people, they've lied and they've cheated and they've stolen. Do you know that I don't put a bumper sticker on the back of my car that says Jesus is my co-pilot. Do you know why? I'm a bad driver. <laughs> I am. I'm a third world driver. I grew up in a third world, and I am a third world driver. Now, listen, you don't want to, Zach, uh, uh, the executive pastor here, he never lets me drive, ever. No matter where we go, he never lets me drive. But if we're going to LAX, I'm behind the wheel. You know why? I can get around that loop in three minutes. You know why? <laughs> Lines mean nothing to me. It mean nothing to me. I grew uh, what, what do you mean that line? And I don't know why you people stop at stop signs. It blows my mind. I mean, there are so many stop signs in San Pedro. They are there just to simply tell you, slow down. That's how I grew up. That was my way. So there's no way I'm putting Jesus as my co-pilot. I am a bad representation of Jesus behind the wheel. Amen every single one of you, because I've seen you in the parking lot. Amen? <laughs> How many of you have made mistakes in Jesus' name? Like, everyone knows you're a Jesus follower, right? But you've made some mistakes. Anybody? Anyone? Amen. Before you start judging me, okay? <laughs> the church isn't perfect. But Thomas is super disappointed with Judas. He called himself a believer, though he wasn't. He was the son of perdition. But he acted like he was. But there are some in the church that have made mistakes and there's people that won't come to church anymore because of people that are in the church. And if you're an unbeliever, I want to stop right now and I just want to apologize. You see, Christians aren't perfect. And I'm not making excuses for us. We just believe in Jesus because we believe that Jesus is perfect and that he paid the price of our sin. But what amazes me, now I'm still speaking to the unbeliever, what amazes me is how you blame Jesus for something that someone in the church has done. Let me explain. That makes no logical sense to me. Jesus is the one that paid the price of your sin. Jesus is the one that conquered death to give you eternal life. Jesus is the one that's done that. This would be like you being cut off on the 405 and coming home and kicking your dog. It makes no sense to me. The person who cut you off is the one that made the mistake. Your dog has welcomed you at the door. Hey, so glad you're home. Get away. <laughs> what did the dog do? Nothing. You're just upset. But it's not the dog's fault. Thomas, he didn't show up because he's disappointed with God. And he's disappointed with God's people. It's the days of Thomas. Thomas. But I have a second question. I said, the second one is this. Why had Thomas lost his faith? Now, this is important. Because we're living in the days of Thomas, it's important for us to understand this because many people's faith today have grown cold. 
people have made a resolute decision today. I will not believe. In fact, many people that were in the church are deconstructing their faith is a big term that's out now. And they're choosing not to believe just like Thomas. I will not believe. And maybe it stemmed from the fact that someone, they were disappointed with God or someone of God's people. But Thomas gives us even greater insight as to what I believe the days of Thomas are all about. Would you take a look with me at verse 25? So Thomas says to them, unless I see. Here's what Thomas says. Prove it. Prove it. See, Thomas was taking the scientific approach. And that's the way that most of the world operates today prove it. And I'm going to prove it to you with Nacho Libre. (laughs) Now, I would usually never quote a movie, especially Nacho Libre. But it's important for you to hear the doctrine of Hollywood. Listen carefully. Nacho, I'm a little concerned about your salvation and stuff. How come you have never been baptized? Stephen, his assistant, because I never got around to it. I don't know why you always have to be judging me because I only believe in science. Did you hear the doctrine? Now, we all laugh at the movie, him and his stretchy pants. We all laugh at the movie. But Hollywood is preaching a doctrine. We believe in science If it can't be proven, then I won't believe. We're living in the days of Thomas. Thomas was not going to believe in the resurrection until it had been proven to him empirically that Jesus had risen from the dead. What a sad state that he was living in. What a sad state the world is living in. I don't believe in the resurrection. I don't believe that my marriage can be resurrected from death to life. I don't believe that my situation can be resurrected from death to life. I don't believe that my relationship with my prodigal son or daughter can be resurrected. I don't believe in the resurrection. And it's where most of the world finds themselves today. There is no resurrection. And if there is, prove it, God. Let God prove why there's evil in this world if he's so good. And if he's all-powerful, then why is there evil? Can he not do anything about it? So he can't be good, and he can't be all-powerful if there's so much evil in the world. Let God prove why my college professors at UC Berkeley are wrong, and he's so right. Let God prove that he exists. Let God prove that he exists, because I've been exposed to evolution, and now I'm wondering... And and there's a lot of technological wonders out there like artificial intelligence. Look what man can do with scientific research and and data. I will not believe we're living in the days of Thomas. But can I tell you something, church? The story is not over. Would you take a look at the power of the resurrection in John chapter 20? Look at verse 26. And after eight days, now what the Bible is saying is, remember, Jews count the day of. We count the next day. So this is seven days later. Even though the Bible, John's a Jew, he's saying eight days, they count the day of. We always count the next day. That's why he rose three days later, because Jews count the day that he died. Okay? So let's go on. Now we're talking about Sunday, the next week. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside. They're having church. And Thomas was with them. Jesus came and the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said to him, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here. Look at my hands and reach your hand to here. Put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, here's what's happening. 
they have gathered again for church on Sunday. They're expecting Jesus to show up just like we do every Sunday so that we can experience his peace and his presence and his power. They're there in that room. They're having church. And I want you to see Thomas was with them. Believers are hanging out with unbelievers at church. Blows my mind. And our disciples are going to do us a great job to teach us the kind of character that we need when unbelievers come into the church. It's John chapter 20. Look at verse 25 one more time. The other disciples therefore said to him, we've seen the Lord. Now I need to help you understand the Greek of this. And usually I try to just explain in a sermon, but you need to understand. Listen, they said to him means they kept saying, he's risen. He's risen, Thomas. Thomas, he's risen, Thomas, I'm telling you. He's risen. We saw him. I saw the risen Lord. I saw his hands. I saw his side. I'm telling you, Thomas, he's alive. They kept saying they were persistent. They didn't give up. They did not give up. Church, can I tell you something? Not everyone comes to Christ when you want them to, but it doesn't mean they won't come to Christ. Not everyone's going to come on the Easter that you think they should be there, but that doesn't mean that they won't come again. Don't give up. And the most powerful thing that they were telling Thomas was their testimony. You see, they were telling Thomas, we saw his hands, we saw his side. Because Thomas says, unless I see his hands and his side myself, all the disciples were doing were giving their testimony. That's it. They were communicating to Thomas the testimony that they had of Jesus. Let me tell you something what happened just this past, <clears throat> this past Easter. There was a guy that came to church. And he came to church because there's a guy in our church who I don't know who goes to his work at the port and tells him every Monday what he saw happen at South Bay. Yeah, three people came forward and gave their life to Jesus. Pastor Chet said their marriage got saved. And then we learned this. And then we did this. And then this Sunday, oh, 20 people came forward. And then you should have seen it. It's like the whole church came forward. Like God is doing something powerful at South Bay. And because this guy was telling his friend Monday after Monday after Monday, the guy shows up and comes walking down the aisle and receives Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord. Because when he walked in, because of the testimony, the most powerful tool that you have is your personal testimony of Jesus. Go on Monday and tell people what God is doing in your life. But what I love about the disciples is not only are they being persistent, Thomas is not being ostracized by them either. It's not us versus them. Did you hear what I just said? Thomas is with them. And they're with Thomas. It's not, oh, she is definitely an unbeliever and she just sat next to me. I mean, look what she is wearing. Does she have to show all of those tattoos? Oh my goodness. Is that alcohol I smell? Oh my goodness. Listen, we had someone show up a few weeks ago when they opened their car door. The pot smoke just it came right out the door. People were happier than they've ever been coming into church. It was overwhelming. Couldn't believe it. Came to church and they sat down. What are you going to do when they come with you? Oh, it's them. They're here. The unbelievers. What do we do? What do we say? How do we say it? I don't know what to do. I've got to go to work on Monday. <laughs> we're so used to praise God, glory to Jesus, hallelujah. We don't even know how to say hello. How are you? We've got to move away from the us and the them. The disciples are operating by grace. Let me tell you why. The disciples didn't believe a week before. They were unbelievers. 
It took Jesus showing up in their house to say that they were believers. And so they had mercy for Thomas. They had grace for Thomas because they didn't forget where they had come from. Is it possible that we've forgotten where we've come from? We were once unbelievers. But the disciples... They knew the kindness of God leads us to repentance. So they didn't reject Thomas simply because he didn't believe. No, they extended mercy and grace. Let me tell you something. Thomas had been through it, man. He just lost one of his best buddies on a cross. Think of the tragic experience that Thomas was going through. Not only did Judas betray everybody, but I lost my best buddy because of it. Do you have any idea what the world has been through? That mean, angry, bitter person that you want nothing to do with, do you know their story? Do you know what they've been through in their life? Last week, we showed the, uh, a testimony of Alyssa. And as we showed that testimony, do you know how many people went to her Sunday and apologized to her because they judged her because she was the one going, whoa, thank you, Jesus. There were people that walked up to her and said, I didn't know your story. I didn't know where you came from. Do you realize that the world is hurting and you don't know their story, all you see is their bitterness. All you see is that person next to work who you want nothing to do with. Be careful. We're living in the days of Thomas. And just because they're rejecting God doesn't mean that God has rejected them. And we need to be the church like the disciples who gathered Thomas around them and encouraged him to come into the fold, to come to church so that they could see and feel the peace and the presence of Jesus, that they can experience the power of God. Because Jesus, when Thomas was there in the room, the Bible says that Jesus came into the midst of them. You know why? Wherever two or more are gathered, there I am in the midst. Jesus loves when unbelievers show up for church. Because they are going to experience the peace of his presence. They're going to experience the power of the resurrection. And what I love about Jesus is he's not doing this. I can't believe she came to church dressed like that. I can't believe I think he's drunk. Ugh. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Think just for a moment, church. And I know I'm seeming like I'm being dramatic, but what's happening in your heart? It's important. I had a mom come to me and say, my son leads a gang. Do you think he'll be accepted if he came on Easter? Yeah. I just hugged her. And I said, if he isn't, we're the problem, not him. Yeah. Jesus had no issue with unbelievers in the midst of that church service. He's not mad at Thomas. He didn't say, Thomas, I can't believe that you didn't think I was alive. I mean, for the love, Thomas. Look at me, all right? No, no, no. That's not what he did. When he came into the room, he pronounced peace over Thomas. And I want you to see something that's so important. It's not that Jesus didn't know that Thomas, didn't know what Thomas had said. He repeats to Thomas exactly what Thomas said. He said, go ahead. Put your hands in, my, in the hole and go ahead, touch my side. Can I tell you something? Jesus is revealing something. Even though he's not physically present, he hears everything. He knows what's going on in your heart right now. He knows what's going on in your mind right now. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. And what he's revealing here is, Thomas, I know I wasn't physically present, but I knew exactly what was going on. And I heard everything what you said. And despite what you said, I'm pronouncing peace over you. Let me tell you why. Jesus always leaves the 99 to get the one. Amen. 
It's just what Jesus does. He always will go after your prodigal son. He'll always go after your prodigal daughter that grew up in the church. It's just what Jesus does. It's so important that when unbelievers come into Calvary Chapel, South Bay, that they sense the peace of the presence of Jesus. Now, I know my responsibility. I'm going to lead our church into green pastures. I'm going to make sure it's clean. I'm going to make sure our ushers are ready. I'm going to make sure that there are Bibles. I'm going to prepare for the moment. But it's not just me. When unbelievers come into our presence, we've got to be those kind of people that give the peace and speak Jesus over their lives. We've got to be involved with the peace process that Jesus offers. And I need to let you know something, okay? Jesus and the disciples are not moved by the unbelieving behavior of Thomas. They're not scooching over in the pew. Jesus walks in the room, peace. The disciples, hallelujah. There is nothing that has moved them. Thomas is miserable, but it's not affecting the disciples. And it definitely hasn't affected Jesus. And Jesus, he ministers to Thomas right where he's at. And he says to Thomas, Thomas, go ahead. Touch my hand. Now, before my grandfather died, we always went to his house on Sundays after church. And he was kicked out of the church, but he, he came to Christ literally on his deathbed. But my grandfather didn't believe in dentures, and he had one tooth. One tooth. That's it. And every Sunday when I was a kid, he would grab my hand, make me point my finger. He was so proud he still had one tooth. He wanted me to feel it. it was the, I, I cringe when I think about it even now. And I wonder, did Jesus grab Thomas's hand? You want to feel it? Come here. <laughs> Touch it. I want you. Go ahead. Put your finger right there. I want you to keep putting your finger right there. I, I wonder what happened with Jesus and Thomas in that moment. Let me tell you something. It was nothing but grace and peace. Jesus cares about one. That's why the Bible said, and he said to Thomas. Now I have a question. Who's your one? Who do you care about more than anything to get saved? Because Jesus cares about that one as well. And Jesus met him where he was at. He stooped down in humility and met Thomas where he was at. Church, we can't be uncomfortable when people don't believe. We've got to meet them where they're at and love them enough not to leave them there, but to bring them to the place of peace and hope and love. Take a look at Romans 15. Romans 15, we then, Christians, we who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak. We should bear with the world, not judge the world, and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. Remember I told you the power, remember I told you the story wasn't over? And I know that we're living in the days of unbelief, and I know that it seems impossible. But the power of the resurrection overcame his resolute, scientifically approached unbelief. The power of the resurrection overcame his resolute, scientifically approached unbelief. And the unbeliever in a moment became a believer, my Lord and my God. Even Jesus in a moment declares him to be a believer and says to Thomas, you believe because you have seen. In fact, the faith of Thomas, my Lord, my God, becomes the climax of the entire Gospel of John. John has been trying to prove to us that Jesus is God. And now at the end of this book, Thomas announces this unbeliever who became a believer is teaching us a lesson about God. <clears throat> my Lord and my God. Hey, church. I know we're living in the days of Thomas. And I need you to listen to me. I know we're living there. But for too long, the church has been silenced because we're focusing on the lie that people won't believe in our day. 
We've believed it. We need to believe like the disciples and trust the Lord will show up and do what he's been doing for 2,000 years and converting unbelievers to believers in a moment. And he wants you to use, to use you to do it. Are you willing to trust him to show up? Let me tell you something. I have 2,000 years of research and data proving that the power of the resurrection has been changing people's lives. Millions of people. I've got more data than any research project has ever been undertaken. No one's got more research than heaven of the power of the resurrection. And even though we are living in the days of Thomas, Jesus made something very clear. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Can I tell you something about the days of Thomas when it comes to the power of the resurrection? The days of Thomas gives the greatest opportunity for the Lord to be most glorified. In this day, when Jesus is here spiritually within his church, he's saying, blessed are those who have not seen. He's declaring that there is a harvest in the 21st century, even though we're living in the days of unbelief, because the word of Jesus is true. Now, church, listen. There may be a lot to overcome in these days of Thomas. And you may believe that your person that you're praying for, they'll never come to Christ. That's what the disciples believed about Thomas. And in a moment, he went from radical unbelief to radical belief. And I want you to trust the testimony of heaven. Listen to what the angel told Mary about God. It's Luke chapter 1, verse 37. The Bible says, For with God, nothing will be impossible. And I know they didn't come to Christ this Easter, but it doesn't mean they won't come. Because look what Jesus said. With men, this is impossible. You're right. In the days of Thomas, where there's so much unbelief, I know with men this is impossible. However, with God, all things are possible. Hey, church, do not be unbelieving. Don't fall for the lie, but be believing. Today is the day of salvation. Do you want the blessing today? Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for the great grace of God today. And in our 1230 service, Lord, we want to give you glory and we want to give you honor. Because we believe that today is the day of salvation and that you are doing a great work. And so now, Christian, I want you to be in prayer. And I'm speaking to the unbeliever that's in the room. Listen carefully. You have steadfastly said, I will not believe. I will not believe. But I believe that the power of the resurrection and the peace of his presence you sense right now. You see, there is a truth about life, and the truth about life is this. Each one of us faces a last breath. And Jesus doesn't care where you're at. He just doesn't want to leave you there because if you stay there as an unbeliever, you're going to be eternally separated from God. And believers that are sitting in this room, this is the moment that we long for. In fact, it took Thomas seven days We'll take seven minutes just to pray for you. Today is your day. Today's the day that you can make a right relationship with God. Don't use anything as your excuse because the enemy just wants to lie to you to keep you from being with God. But maybe you're like Thomas and you followed God. You grew up in the church. You walked away. You're disappointed with God or disappointed with God's people, discouraged in the midst of your trial. Maybe you're just coming back from COVID and you're realizing, man, 
I need to make my relationship with God right. Today is your day as well. So here's what I'm going to do like I've done in every service. And let me tell you something. I had a mom in the 1030 service. She brings her children to church. She makes them come to church every single week. And last week, Easter, one of her sons gave her life, his life to the Lord. And this week, one who said, I will not come, gave his life to the Lord because of the power of the resurrection in the days of unbelief. I want to lead you guys in a prayer. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you and give you the words to say to King Jesus. The church, they're going to say it with you because we believe in glorifying God together. We want you to know we're with you. Just like the disciples were with Thomas, we're with you. So church, would you back them up? Would you be there with them and for them? And would you say this prayer after me, dear Jesus? I believe. I believe in you. You're the Son of God. And today, I believe in the resurrection. Resurrect my life, my Lord, and my God. In Jesus' name. we'd like to pray with you for just a minute and give you the Bible and a Bible study you haven't joined our church we don't have a church membership you've come to the family of God and so Pastor Dennis is right here and he just wants to pray with you for just a minute church would you applaud them as they go you'll be back with your friends in just a minute Here at Calvary Chapel, South Bay, we memorize scripture. Take a look at the screen. It's John 20, verse 27. Would you say it with me? Do not be unbelieving, but don't believe the lie anymore. Your neighbor, that miserable neighbor can get saved. That person you work with, don't believe the lie. They can get saved. And our challenge to change this week is this. Trust God, not culture, and believe that those you are praying for can be saved. Now, you know what I love? People are going to our banner that we put the names on, and they're peeling people's names off one by one because we're seeing L.A. reached for Jesus Christ. So God bless you guys. I'll see you out in the lobby. Have a wonderful day. Maybe we'll see you tonight.